So we started, I want to estimate the state of the ocean at a given time, given one observation as a, as a, at one time, and we formulated as a vision uh, problem. And we derived the objective function where we look for the state that is not far from the data prediction error. And I want to minimize the error that is not far from some prior information, which is usually a forecast. And we come up with the blue equation when the H is linear. Now, what we said is that this formulation doesn't include all the available information, so we're missing uh, some information we can include, and there is no framework to update uh, the, to you know uh, to update this uh, background covariance in time. Then we went to 4D var Bayesian formulation again. We want to estimate all the state of the ocean over one period, so I want to uh, include information from dynamics and from all available uh, data and based on some probability conditional distributions since I know the likelihood and I know I assume that the likelihood is Gaussian and I assume that the, the model error is Gaussian I end up with the uh, cost, uh, 4 var cost function which is basically the 3 var. the only difference is when I assume that the model is perfect is that I'm computing model minus data over a window and it's a very nice, very powerful tool. The main disadvantage is, again, when I finish this window, what is the next B? What is the next background? Uncertainties on the estimate. It needs an adjoint model. And developing adjoint model is, is uh, it requires some efforts. And also, at the end, I quickly said it, it might have some issues with nonlinearities if the window is large. And usually, we like to have large windows to include more dynamics. So I come. Uh, okay, here you go. So now I'll talk today about the Bayesian filtering problem, which is becoming uh, more popular somehow for the, uh, and a lot of people are using it in the operational centers. And I'll start again from my Bayesian filtering perspective, uh, Bayesian uh, formulation perspective to show you how these uh, are related to the 4 var uh, problem. So in filtering, the only difference is that I'm looking for the uh, estimating the state of the ocean now, given only previous observations. Okay, so it's assuming I have a window of data from zero to n. At the end of the window, I'll get the same solution as 4 var. Only at the end. But while I'm I'm processing the data as they become available till n, I'm only using the previous observations. So it's a, it's a natural framework for forecasting. You know, I only use the data when they become available. So now I compute, now I run the model, I get the data, and then I update again. And basically, f following very similar derivations uh, for, uh, as for DVAR as we did, we can start, start assuming I want to estimate the state now, given all the observation uh, now. I can split this distribution with bias into, uh, into predicting the likelihood and also the, uh, the prior, you know. So basically, this is the forecast because I'm using the observation. I'm only using the observation one time before. And this is the likelihood with the data that just uh, arrived. So if you write it down, you will end up exactly as a 3D-like setting where you have the uh, probability of now of the data given all uh, of the state given all the data is the distribution of uh, the likelihood multiplied by the prior, the forecast. So this is the forecast because I'm using all the observation up to last one. I'm not using the one now. So this is what we call forecast. So it's a 3D-like uh, formulation, and it's exactly like a 3D assimilation uh, if I know the prior. OK, so this is a forecast. This is the likelihood, and this is a posterior. It's exactly like 3D uh, system. So since we know the solution of the 3D, when the error is Gaussian, I can directly solve this one. The question is how to get the probability distribution of the uh, prior. In, in contracts with 4 var where I look at the, the maximum a posteriori estimate, here I'm, 
I have to estimate the whole distribution. So the question is how to get this one. And what, and what we can show is that I can get this one just by propagating the previous distribution, analysis distribution, with the model. This is just the Kolmogorov graph equation, just uh, I'm giving it this way. But basically, I'm, I'm propagating all the, uh, I have the distribution, uh, this is a model distribution, and this is the prior distribution, and I'm, I'm, I'm just updating it with the, propagating it with the model. When I'll come to the algorithm, you'll uh, see much clearly how it's done. Uh, so this is a posterior at a previous time. This is the model, and I get the prior. So there are two steps, basically. One step to update the, uh, to propagate the distribution in time, and one step to update the distribution as a 3D assimilation. So basically what's going on, I have the distribution, I have time, but now I have distribution. It's not a state, as I did it in 4D var. I get a probability, I get the distribution at a given time, I run it with a model. The question is how to up update a distribution with a model, and then I get the data, update the distribution with bias, and I run again. So you know you have a forecast step, update step, but we're talking in terms of distributions every time. I'm carrying a distribution with me and updating it with a 3D assimilation. It's exactly the same way. So how do I implement this? Is this? So as I said at the beginning, this is the uh, at the end of the assimilation window, and I'm, if I'm as, uh, I'm putting I'm uh, implementing this perfectly, base you know I'm solving base. Exactly, I should get the same exact solution, and if the model is perfect, I should get the same exact solution between 4D var and this formulation at the end of the assimilation window, if I used all the available uh, information. Now, how to implement this? Now, <coughs> so the another step comes down to a multiplication of two distributions, so it sounds easy. If both of them are Gaussian, I end up with Gaussian, and I end up with the blue. Okay, now, but since the ocean model is nonlinear, even if you start with a Gaussian, I integrate a Gaussian distribution with a model, I get to a non-Gaussian distribution. And in this case, the, the, you know, the, the blue formulation breaks in there, and I have to assume something. So it's not an easy problem. You know, it's not just multiplying two distributions. Multiplying two distributions, if they are not Gaussian, it's co quite complicated. Okay, and one of the simplest form of filtering is, I'm sure you heard about it, is what we call Kalman filtering. And the Kalman filtering is designed for linear systems with Gaussian noise. And why it's easy? Because when the system is linear and the noise is Gaussian, all distributions are Gaussian, and I only need to, to estimate the mean and a covariance. A Gaussian distribution is characterized by the first two moments, mean and a covariance. And this is what Kalman can do in a very nice way. So how does it work? Uh, so I start from a Gaussian distribution. Gaussian distribution, it has a mean and a covariance. When I know this, I know all the distribution. I integrate it with a model. <coughs> so this is a forecast step. I just update the mean with the model and update the covariance of the Gaussian distribution. And the way it's updated is we, since the model is linear, there are two components. This is the model error covariance and this is the propagation of the error in time. So the forecast is straightforward. If you have a small model, not a big ocean model, just take, this should take two lines in MATLAB to implement. And I get, since the model is linear, I get another Gaussian distribution, okay? And then I get the data. And once I have the data, I have exactly a 3D assimilation step. I have a Gaussian distribution here. I have the observational error that is Gaussian. So I can exactly apply this 3D var, a uh, 3D blue, uh, 3D blue step for updating the distribution. This is exactly 3D, huh? and it's just we are adding on top of the 3D assimilation this propagation of the uh, uh, to compute the prior. So we are updating the prior dynamically with the model compared to a 3D system. And I get again a Gaussian distribution. I can cycle. So forecast analysis, forecast analysis. I, I forecast till I get the data. When I get the data, I update the, distribu I update the distribution with bias, and I forecast again. So what's the issue with that? Why we cannot implement it with the ocean? There are two issues, of course. The ocean dynamics are nonlinear. 
So this, I cannot apply it. And worse, I, I'm dealing with matrices. I have to, you know, if I'm running a mod ocean model where the state is like 10 to the 8, these matrices are 10 to the 8, 10 to the 8. I cannot store them. I cannot manipulate them. So I have to do some approximation. Otherwise, I cannot implement it. So the first thing you can think about is that, OK, I, I want to linearize if the model, the ocean model is nonlinear, I will linearize it. OK? And if the H, for some reason, is nonlinear, I will linearize it. And I get the same equations as before exactly. But the only difference is I'm linearizing the model and I'm linearizing the observational error, the observation operator, if they are nonlinear. We still have the same problem with computationally because it's still the same dimensions we're dealing with. And there are a study from Evanson in 1994, if I remember correctly, that shows that there are issues when the problem is strongly nonlinear. This linearization might not work very well. It might introduce some noise. So for a while, you know, we forget about the nonlinearity. And one way the people found to deal with the, uh, with, you know, to not deal with the, these very large matrices was to go to low rank approximations of the covariance matrix. And this is what we call, you know, the f filters like uh, RS, uh, R reduced order square root filters or seek filters. They are all very close to each other. And the idea is to assume that the the, uh, the covariance matrix of filter as a low rank, so I can decompose it into L, U, L, T. Instead of having a big, very big matrix, I have a small matrix with the number of columns is the rank. The rank. So instead of 10 to the 8, I work with 100 columns. I don't, I don't need to store P. I never compute P. We compute only L and R by R, low rank matrix U. So it becomes applicable. And so if you take this and you put it in a Kalman filter equations, Again, you don't deal with P anymore. You deal with L and U. L and U are, we can handle them as matrices. And you get exactly the same algorithm, but again, we're dealing with L and we're dealing with U and we can implement uh, these things. I think in Mercator, they are applying something. This is what Mercator is applying right now, I think, and operationally. Uh, and you get a Gaussian distribution and you come back and you're only avoiding P by playing with L. But you still need to linearize the model. OK? Here, if M is nonlinear, you have to linearize and compute the evolution of L. And so this is where the ensemble Kalman filtering, I'm sure a lot of people heard about it. It's very vi r widely used uh, now, and not only on ocean, atmosphere, hydrology, reservoir. This is the method now that is everyone likes it because it's easy to implement. And how does it work? So the idea, I want to avoid linearization. OK? Uh, so the idea is to replace the forecast step by Monte Carlo forecast step. So I don't linearize. I assume I know I have samples of the distribution of the prior distribution now. I want to make the forecast, forecast the distribution next. I just run an ensemble you know, from the samples. I integrate the samples with the model. It's just Monte Carlo implementation. You have input. Uh, you have a function and you have an uncertain input. What is the distribution of the uncertain outputs? It's just by sample the input integrated with the model and I get samples of the output from which I estimate the statistics. So I want to estimate, uh, estimate the mean and the covariance through samples. This is a uh, whole idea. So what uh, the ensemble Kahneman does, I have samples. I assume I have started with samples. I just integrate it with the model. And the nice thing about it also is that I don't have to deal with Q, this very large covariance matrix. If I can sample the errors, I just put it implicitly during the forecast run. So I can perturb the forcing. I can perturb any uh, unknown uh, parameters or input in the system and include Q directly in the, in the samples. So we call these members, ensemble members. I start with a bunch of points. I run the model for each point. And it's very nice because it's fully parallel. If you have a huge machine, you can run each member with uh, on a given set of CPUs. They are completely independent uh, runs. So I get the forecast members. From these forecast members, I can compute a mean and a covariance. Okay. 
these are the mean of the covariance that I consider as the estimate of the uh, of the blue. But now, what you need to know is that when I run, even if I start with a Gaussian distribution, when I run it with a model, I get a non-Gaussian distribution. If I have a non-Gaussian distribution here, I cannot apply the blue. But what Kalman does, what the ensemble Kalman does, and why this is why we call it Kalman, we replace this not Gaussian with Gaussian. So I assume it's Gaussian. I only take the mean and a covariance. I drop the whole statistics, higher order statistics from it. When I I consider only the mean and the covariance, and I assume Gaussian, I can apply blue. So I can do a Kalman update. So the approximation, there are two big approximations. One is here because I'm only taking the Gaussian part of the distribution. And the other one, I cannot take very large samples. You have a big distribution in general. You need, you know, you have a distribution in a dimension 10 to the 8. To sample it, there is a curse of dimensionality here. You, you need, I don't know, you know, very, very large number of members. But we cannot run 1 million, 10 million models at the same time. So we end up running 100, 50, 100. That's what we can afford now. And surprisingly, it works very well. Just we run a small ensemble size, we assume Gaussianity, we mix these two together, and everything works well. So from a Gaussian model error, uh, observational error Gaussian, I get a Gaussian uh, distribution as the update, and we apply Kalman as usual. Okay, so I take the mean of this distribution, the covariance, and I apply a 3D assimilation step, a blue step. Okay, this is what we call deterministic ENKF. And I'll tell you why we call it deterministic ENKF in one second. But now, when I get these, I need, to, I need to restart for the next forecasting cycle. And I have a mean and a covariance. Okay, from the mean and the covariance, I need to resample. I need a new sample to start the next forecast step, right? And the way we do it, we look for an ensemble of points, a set of points that exactly match the mean and the covariance, from which I restart. OK? And if you heard about the ensemble transform Kalman filter, or you know, the, the, the singular evolutive and interpolated Kalman filter, we can write them in such a way that the new ensemble is the forecast ensemble multiplied by some transformation matrix. That's, it's not a big matrix. It's, it's the size of the ensemble size. So it's a small matrix. We can derive it explicitly. And you can come up with the new analysis ensemble from the forecast ensemble and straight away. Now, the, what I don't like about this deterministic formulation is that we're, there are infinite ways to uh, sample this new ensemble analysis, just multiplied by any orthogonal matrix here. But the way we are sampling is just algebraic, an algebraic way. We're just matching mean and a covariance without taking into account the form of the distribution I'm starting with. It's just deterministic sampling, and this is why we call it deterministic ENKF. Okay? The other way where actually it's the original ensemble Kalman filter, which we call now stochastic ENKF, is instead of updating the mean of the covariance, what the stochastic ENKF does, it updates each member okay, with, with the Kalman. But we have to perturb the observation. So instead of using the same observation for, for each member, and this is the original ENKF, later on there was another paper in 1998 saying that we need to update the, we need to perturb the observations, otherwise, otherwise the covariance of this will not be equal to the covariance of Kalman later on. But even if you perturb, you will only uh, match the Kalman co uh, covariance asymptotically. Okay, so if you have a very large number of observations, uh, a very large of, uh, number of observations, small ensemble size, you will very hardly match the second uh, moment of the Kalman. And this includes errors in the system, like in the ocean. So the state of the art in the ocean is to use these deterministic ENKFs because we have large, large, uh, a large number of observations and small ensemble sizes. Okay, otherwise you will introduce noise in the system. But the nice thing about the ENKF is that with this random 
perturbation, you can show that the stochastic ANKF sample from a Gaussian distribution. So the members are following a Gaussian distribution. So the spread of them is following a shape distribution, where these are just sampling algebraically. OK? Now, in terms of implementation, what is the issues in here? We have a small ensemble size. You know, In terms of application, we can only afford in the hundreds. So, so we have rank deficiency. OK? And we also, we're not including, we don't know all the uncertainties in the system. Uh, so what uh, happens is that with rank deficiency, and we're not uh, putting all the uncertainties in the system by, by applying the update with the data every time on the members, the members start to shrink. Okay, we're only assuming uncertainties in the initial condition, basically. So there is uh, underestimated covariance. The spread is small. Since there is rank deficient and applying the update in the background covariance and the ensemble covariance, uh, then there are no degrees of freedom to fit the data. So if you have 100 members, basically you can fit 100 information. Okay, so if you have more information coming, more degrees of freedom coming from the data, in the ensemble phase, you cannot fit it. So there are these three main issues that we know about. And there are these two very naive solutions that work surprisingly well in practice. The first one is, OK, there is rank deficiency. I cannot fit the observations uh, because I have a fixed uh, small rank from the ensemble. What we do is we just localize uh, the covariance. So I, I go from a low rank covariance. I multiply it by some localization function, and I drop every uh, long range correlations. And this will give me a full rank covariance with which I can fit the data. The other thing, the, the other uh, advantage of this is that you see, you know, when we have a small ensemble, the long range correlations are noisy. Okay, this is what we call spurious long range correlations. It was discussed very nicely in a uh, paper with Hamel, if I remember correctly. And they cut the, the long-range correlation and end up with a full-rank covariance with more reliable short-range correlation and apply it to the, uh, and I use that to update the member set. Okay, this is to mitigate these two. So I add more degrees of freedom and I get rid of long-range correlations. And for the underestimated covariance, okay, I just multiply it by, I just inflate it. If you heard about inflation, it's just, a constant that's saying the covariance should be larger than that. So I just multiply it by a constant that is larger than one. Okay? It's lately also it's becoming very popular to say that the ensemble is not large enough to, uh, to uh, represent all the, sub the space, the state space. So the ideas came uh, to hybridize the covariance is that we make it half flow dependent with the ensemble and half of a B that, you know, the, uh, the weather center, they worked a lot on getting a reliable B, so they add this one to this one. So it's just a hybrid covariance. One is evolving with the ensemble, one is static, and the role of this one is to add whatever missing from this one and give it also some smoothness, some climatology uh, uh, around. But for now, you know, you cannot, you know, even if you, you cannot, to send a paper was saying I implemented the Kalman, the ensemble Kalman, without applying localization and inflation or some sort to deal with the underestimation and the long range correlations of the covariance. So, with these two things work uh, very well. Just to quickly, some, you know, for it's also very popular now to use, and I think in many centers they are using these, the what we call ensemble OI methods. And as you suggest from the name, it's an optimal interpolation scheme. So the idea is I want to save computing. I don't want to up update the members uh, in time. So I have a fixed covariance made from ensemble uh, of points, and I apply 3D var. It's like, a, it's like an optimal interpolation where the background is having a static ensemble uh, in it. And we call this ENOI. Okay? Uh, so quickly, what is the difference between stochastic and deterministic ANKFs? And I think I discussed most of it uh, already. So the, SNK, uh, the stochastic ANKF, and which we call ANKF, it's random samples from a, from a Gaussian distribution. 
even though the distribution is approximated to be Gaussian, it's good to have a spread that is following some, uh, some given distribution compared to the deterministic NKF, which sample without uh, thinking is just sample mean and a covariance. Okay. The nice thing about stochastic NKF is that since the, up the update is applied to each member, it can implicitly uh, include and account for model errors, for localization, and all these things in a nice way, implicitly in the members, because you don't need to resample. In the deterministic NKF is different. If you have a model error covariance and you add it to the low rank covariance from the ensemble, you're increasing the rank, so resampling becomes an issue. While in the stochastic NKF, it's implicit. Okay? So when we compare, these are the community view about stochastic ENKF and DENKF. These are two reviewers. I do not know who are they. For two papers we submitted. We submitted a paper in 2011 with the Lawrence 96 model. And the guy was saying, the reviewer was saying, why you're using perturbed observation, you should not use perturbed observations, which is a stochastic ENKF, because we know they don't work well. Okay. This was a very interesting uh, review from another reviewer who said, why are you using this stochastic NKF? You sh it's old. You should use a square root deterministic uh, NKF. They are newer. But what we mi he missed is that we were apply applying stochastic NKF for two, um, so for two uh, for, uh, with thousands of members for a 1D model. So we, were, we had enough members to, re to uh, to sample well the, the observation error covariance. And I will show you one, the ENKF, stochastic ENKF work well, one it's not. This is the Lawrence 96 model. We use it a lot in the ensemble Kahneman filtering community to test uh, ensemble schemes, how they work well or not. And when we applied the stochastic ENKF and the ETKF, uh, we compared several uh, uh, deterministic ENKF and the stochastic ENKF to these models, to this Lorentz 96 model, it has 40 variables, it's a very nonlinear model. What we see here, I plotted the variance from the, this is the deterministic ENKF, it's the first order approximation of the gain from Sakov. And so he drops a, uh, the second order uh, term from the, from the uh, gain and it overestimates the variance. That is one sort of square root deterministic ENKF in black. And if you apply the stochastic ENKF, you get the red because you have a small ensemble. I think here it was 20 or 30 members. And since you're under sampling the observational error, the variance of the ensemble is small. Now, when you compare in terms of relative mean square error, the stochastic ENKF with the deterministic ENKF, the ETKF is the most popular in the community. You will see that when I have 80 members here, the deterministic ENKF easily, easily beats the stochastic ENKF when you have a small ensemble size. Beyond when you have enough members to represent well the observational error covariance, the stochastic ENKF will beat it hands down without any issue. Okay, so if you have enough members, Definitely go with the stochastic NKF, but you need enough members to represent well, describe well the observational error covariance. Otherwise, go with the deterministic uh, NKF. Sampling from a given distribution is if it's provide a nicer, better spread than just sampling algebraically from a mean error covariance. Okay. Anyway, so for now, since we have thousands of data, 50, 100 members, we are using these deterministic. Uh, filters, and I just want to give you an example of how this uh, deterministic ENKF works. I'm working, I'm, I'm applying it to the Lorenz 96 with 20 members. These are the 40 variables, and I will run this in time. So I'm first running it without any assimilation of data. I'm running 40, 20 members, and you will see after four or five steps, the members start shooting everywhere. In blue is the intrusive in the green, as they start shooting everywhere. Once I put the data, the spread, the ensemble, the 20 members, shrink the spread, and they go over the green, which I'm trying to estimate. So the ensemble becomes uh, very nicely on top of the green, and I can recover more or less the truth uh, with it. And this is how the ENKF methods work. You know, I run an ensemble, I get the data, 
I shrink the spread, and hopefully it will go over the uh, truth. This is exactly how we do it in a small uh, model, and exactly how we do it with a large uh, model. So I'll give you quickly a few uh, figures from an application in the Red Sea. Why the Red Sea? Because we are on the Red Sea, and we're running now for four kilometer resolution for assimilation. Uh, and we are simulating sea surface temperature and sea surface uh, height. This is a system we have put in place for the Red Sea, and we're trying to put all the data, and our focus now is the to-do filtering with the MIT GCM. This is after assimilation. You see this is a viso. We're putting here 100 members, and this is the analysis, this is the forecast, and we have much higher resolutions than Aviso, so we resolve eddies, of course, uh, more, and on large scales, we look more or less like uh, Aviso interpolated products. Same for the TMI data we are assimilating. We are forecasting very well, and the system is working very nicely with the 100 members, just with inflation localization, without any sophisticated perturbations or anything else. If you look at the RMSE, these are, for example, we assimilate every three days. These are every three days I have this track, we have this track, and this track. This is what we have of uh, data over three days from satellites. And we look at the RMSE error. Aviso is in black, and with the blue we do quite well with, uh, uh, with the filtering scheme. Same thing for TMI with mean forecast and analysis. So the system just with simple uh, inflation localization, it's working uh, very well. You can do also sensitivity to the ensemble size, and you will see, you know, adding members usually uh, help the analysis. But when you add members, the more members you add, the more risk is that some one of the members will blow up and the whole machinery will stop. It blows up maybe because of one issue on one cores, or it blows up also because of some dynamical issues, because the Kalman correction is not fully dynamically consistent. You do also sensitivity with inflation, so the more you inflate, the more you fit the data, of course, but also if you inflate too much, one of the members will blow up and then the whole machinery. So over-inflating is also not good. You use inflation, but moderately. Uh, you can also compare the ensemble camera filter with the ENOI, where the ensemble is just not updated in time. And the but the nice thing about the ENOI is that you don't have problems with inflation. The ensemble is not changing, so it keeps the same spread. So you fit the data better with the analysis, but your forecast is worse. So overfitting is not good neither. Okay? These are results from two weeks ago. It's the first figure we look at, two figures. So what we developed, uh, we have this big machine. So we developed a fault-free system where we can run thousands of members at the same time without, the without us intervening, so that if there a member blows up, the machinery itself, it will detect if it blows up because one core problem, so it will restart. And if not, it will drop the members, bro uh, bring in a new member, and integrate it again. So we are able now to go to 1,000 mem members, and now we're running 5,000 members on the machine. For a 4-kilometer model in the Red Sea, it's 256 course for one motor run, and you multiply this by 1,000, you end up with 250,000 cores running all at the same time and updating the ensemble. So in terms of time, you're not losing anything because you update all of them if you have a big machine at the same time. And surprisingly, and I was surprised with this, when we started looking at the correlations between 100 members and 1,000 members, you know, first we remove many of the spurious correlations, but also even locally, is still, the covariance is still changing. Now, you will not see, see big changes in the RMSE because if you don't have data on top of it, it will not change uh, much. But so far, we're seeing some, still the error is decreasing and the correlations are still changing even after 1,000 uh, members. We're going to 5,000 to see if the system will start converging or it needs, uh, still needs more uh, members. But you know, when you run with 5,000 members with the outputs, it's becoming terabytes and petabytes of data, and it's a big issue. We, you know, we're having issues just analyzing the 5,000 members uh, from one snapshot. Okay, so uh, so again, another slide for the ENKF advantages and challenges as a 4DVAR. The nice thing about it 
it's easy to implement. It's portable. It's non-intrusive. You can take it and plug it in in another uh, model. You don't need to build, spend three years on building an adjoint. It's fully parallel. It's embarrassingly parallel. Just run all the members at the same time. And if you do localization, you can also parallelize the, uh, the, the analysis step. It's designed for forecasting. So you know it, it runs every time it gets data, it updates the forecast and it runs. So it's just waiting to get the data. Once you get the data from uh, uh, on time, you update and you run. OK, and the nice thing about it, it, the ensemble, the spread of the ensemble is an estimate of the covariance, an estimate of the uncertainties, even though it's screwed. The, uh, the disadvantage of it is rank deficient compared to 4 var, which computes the full rank update. It's rank deficient, but with localization, we're able to do something. Something physicians do not like is that it's dynamically inconsistent. It's statistical. So you, know, you might end up with, you know, uh, I don't like optimal, but a good statistical analysis. But when you put the model, the model will not like it. One of the members will blow up. OK, and it's based on Gaussian. So if you want to make it to go to the optimal linear filtering, you better solve the non-Gaussian problem. And this is what I will talk about it in the uh, last session. In the three minutes, I will just show you very quickly a comparison between 4 var an ensemble Kalman in the uh, Gulf of Mexico. And I'll stop with that. <coughs> so we implemented ENKF, uh, the thermistic ENKF, the ensemble adjustment Kalman filter from ICAR, and we compared it uh, with 4 var in exactly the same conditions. <coughs> and it was a problem to predict against the evolution of the loop current in the Gulf of Mexico. So here we have a 10 kilometer model. These are the uh, uh, the uh, state vector, and our reference was uh, HICOM. So we have two months assimilation period and two months forecasting uh, period. And all this just to say one conclusion that I like. <coughs> this is just to show you that also the here the ensemble camera filter works pretty well. This is what Aviso is showing, and this is the, compared to the analysis, we have a higher resolution. And it, sho it shows and forecast and analysis works really well. Uh, again, with just inflation and localization, nothing fancy. <coughs> and then when we compare ensemble Kalman filter to the 4D var to the Aviso, you know, we get pretty similar uh, result. And basically, we used, I think I remember correctly, 50 members. And number of iterations correspond to the same computational cost. And most of them are working quite well. The most, is a most interesting part, what we noticed, is that <coughs> this is the this is HICOM RMC error with the data. This is uh, uh, ENGF in blue. And then this is the red is for DVAR. So this is the analysis. Well, more or less, they work pretty similarly. In the forecasting uh, period, uh, in the ENKF, we fit a little bit more uh, better than the 4D var because 4D var cannot fit with all the dynamics constraints, while ENKF can move away from the dynamics. In the forecasting step, since I'm fitting better uh, with the ENKF, at the beginning, <coughs> in, the f in the first month or so, the ENKF has a, l a smaller error. But over time, the 4D var error becomes uh, smaller. And this is when we look more closely at what's going on don't need to understand very well uh, this figure, but basically we're just measuring the extension of the of the loop current before it sheds. So when it drops, it means that the loop the loop current shedded an eddy. So eddy the eddy uh, detached from the loop current when it drops. And what we found is that for Divar, it's exactly predicting when the eddy will shed. For some dynamic reason, I think I'm putting the only way I can explain this is that the for Divar has some dynamic in it to make the, the detachment, to predict the detachment in a good way. There are some dynamics in there. Otherwise, we tried it in two, three uh, detached events, and the 4 var always get it at the right time for some reasons. Whilst, while the ENKF was not able to get the detachment, it gets the shape very well, but it didn't get the, uh, the detachment at the right time. You can get uncertainties from the ENKF, and it shows it's on top of the where the system will detach. So just to finish the last slide, when I look at 4 var and NKF, what are the advantages disadvantages of each? Green is good. Orange is orange. Uh, so 4 var it requires an adjunct model. It, it's really time consuming. And every time you update the model, you have to update 
you have to make sure that you update its adjoint. You know, it's the tangent linear model, transpose of the tangent linear model. It's fully intrusive. It's non intrusive, so you know, just plug in and run. <coughs> this one is for rank. Here we cannot run hundreds of members. Okay? So it's rank deficient. So you have to do this localization inflation. Sometimes you have long range correlations. When you cut, you're losing them. Okay? So it's not an uh, optimal way. But more or less it's working if you have enough data everywhere. If your data are spreading in of the system. <coughs> propagating, the, the, propagating the uncertainty in the background is not easy in here. Here it's a framework, natural framework to update the uncertainties. And so it's more suitable for a forecasting system. This is a iterative pro optimization process. You always to wait for one iteration. With this one, you run 100, you run 1,000 members. If you have enough machinery, it's the same time. Just boom. Uh, here it's a dynamically consistent solution. It's a model output. So when you put it and you do forecast, it, the model will not scream. Here it might scream sometimes. Because it's a statistically optimal solution, does it mean that the dynamically the model will assimilate it, will swallow it? Okay? And here we can assimilate statistical information, average of the data, climatology, even standard deviation, spread. Here it assimilates only the incoming data as they become available. So there is, I think, a tie. I made it in purpose so one, no one feels uh, 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 offended. Three with three. Okay? Okay, I'll stop here. Thank you very much. <laughs>